Good afternoon, everyone. We are privileged here on our Catholics for Catholics show to have a very special person with us today. Uh, you know him uh, by his face and, and also by what he's done. Uh, Frank Pavone, National Director for Priest for Life, has joined us today. How are you, Frank? It's great to Hi, see you. Hi, John. It's great to be with you. I'm doing great and uh, really excited for some uh, upcoming events and for this new year and this new election year. You've been a great family friend over the years. Uh, I knew you obviously as a seminarian and you knew my parents and it's great just to, now as I'm sitting in uh, the seat of Catholics for Catholics, it's great to just fight alongside you in this pro-life uh, cause. Yes. Uh, you know, yes. first as a uh, as a religious and now now I'm in the, the lay state. So it's great to be here. Um, we have a big event coming up next week. It's uh, the National Prayer Service. We were honored here at Catholic for Catholics when you asked us to help be a, a co-sponsor for this event. We said yes right away, especially considering you got some amazing people that you're going to be uh, showing and giving awards to. The first and foremost is the Bishop Strickland, right? Yes. Um, so before we go into some of those people, uh, namely Bishop Strickland and why you chose to give him an award, uh, just give us some background, Frank, about just, uh, okay, so it's March for Life. It's... It's January 19th. Everyone knows about it. You get almost a million people there every single year, right? But prior to the march, you have a prayer service. And this will be the 29th annual prayer service that you have before the march. Give us some details. And how did you get involved with uh, leading this prayer service, Father? This prayer service is the premier indoor pro-life prayer service of the year. It's been going on, uh, as you said, for now for three decades. And I've been involved in it from the very beginning because national pro-life groups are invited to be part of it. We do it at Constitution Hall. Over the years, we've had different venues and we've used the Capitol uh, Visitor Center. We've used various uh, co congressional and Senate offices, some of them, uh, uh, I mean, meeting rooms, uh, uh, hearing rooms, some of them that are very, very beautiful. Uh, but now we've settled on Constitution Hall, and it really is a tremendous event where people get, first of all, the spiritual encouragement uh, from, uh, from the Word of God and from pro-life messages that are preached. And then secondly, uh, getting charged up for, for the march itself, because we don't go into these events, uh, especially these public witness kind of events, without uh, turning first to the Lord and, uh, and focusing our mind and heart on why we're doing it. We chose Bishop Strickland for the award that we give each year as is one of four uh, award recipients this year, because for pro-life people, uh, his voice has been a great example of what people thirst for in their clergy. They want somebody who's going to speak clearly and boldly on uh, the uh, issue. They want people, furthermore, who are not afraid to criticize the pro-abortion elected officials, especially those who pretend to be Catholic. Uh, and, and, and so often they go unchallenged. People in the pro-life movement, even though, and, and we decided to give Bishop uh, Strickland this award, by the way, before the action was taken to remove him from his diocese um, by, uh, very recently. We, did, we chose him before that because even though his responsibilities were primarily for his diocese of Tyler, we know that every bishop by definition is, is sharing in responsibility for the whole church, but that part of their leadership becomes even more clear when they are leading in the way that he leads, teaching in the way that he teaches, and it should just be ordinary. People should say, oh yeah, of course he's doing that. So is our bishop, so is the bishop over there and over there. But because we have such a vacuum of leadership, someone who steps up and teaches like he does gets nationally known, even internationally known right away. That's what has happened. And for the encouragement he gives to the entire movement, we wanted to recognize him. And he'll be there. He wants to meet the people who come to the prayer service. We're looking forward to that. And I'm, I'm, we love him here at Catholic for Catholics. He's still with us at all of our major rallies at Dodger Stadium and then in Cincinnati when we were sticking up for the uh, for issue one back in August. Uh, we love him. He, you know, he's, he's America's bishop in a lot of ways. And we saw that on the schedule, you actually will be getting, starting with Mass at 7.30, prior to the uh, the event, which starts at 8.30, but 7.30, Holy Mass. And just that thought, too, if you're Catholic, you're going to be attending this, uh, you will have the opportunity to to carry our Lord with you 
sacramentally if you receive him that morning in your march. It will be a viaticum. You'll be taking the Lord with you. So, you know, Frank, thank you so much for putting that there in the schedule, having an opportunity. I will be there myself, so just practical. It'll be uh, great just to have a chance to, to receive our Lord that morning. And going back to, to, to Bishop Strickland, and understanding what's really happened. We've kind of had an unprecedented move. You know, a bishop removed uh, in a very swift uh, move from the Vatican, directly from Pope Francis, had to be signed off by him uh, for some of the things he's been saying. You know, the, you are an expert, Frank, at understanding the political situation right now in this country, especially from a Catholic perspective. Here's my question. In times past, we have had bishops who have been very, very clear in at times coming out and saying, if you are a member of this particular party, political party, which stands in direct opposition to the teachings of the Catholic Church, you are forbidden, you're excommunicated, things like that. I mean, that happened in Germany in the 1930s. A few dioceses took that, took that unprecedented step and said, if you remember the Nazi Socialist Party, you cannot be Catholic. And then and later on, after the Second World War in Italy in the 1940s, with a member of the Communist Party. Have we reached a point in this country where our shepherds need to be making much more clear statements about those who um, you know, ascribe to the beliefs of the Democrat Party and where they stand? Have we reached that point? Uh, we've reached a point where we need very, very, very clear and explicit teaching because the Democrat Party has, number one, become more extreme than ever before. Mark Levin just came out with a book called The Democrat Party Hates America. And I uh, really want to urge people to read it. That is not meant just to be a provocative title. That title is actually the conclusion that anyone who studies the 400 pages of research that he's put into that book will come to. So it's become more extreme uh, in, in and of itself and on such fundamental issues that the church is concerned about, starting with the right to life, but also going to the question of religious freedom and going to the just to the question of what patriotism is. Patriotism is a virtue and uh, authentic and, and proper love for one's own country. Uh, this party has assaulted that. The teachings on marriage, the teachings on the family, uh, human sexuality, gender, all the, the, and these are not some kind of side issues or, or, or uh, issues on which people can take different opinions. These are fundamental issues of doctrine, uh, spirituality, and for the common good. And the, because of the way that the party has been attacking these in a, in a systematic way, in an explicit way, uh, parental rights, again, being another uh, key issue, the church needs to speak up. When the church sees these evils and addresses them, and addresses them uh, even naming uh, the, 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 the people in leadership who are assaulting these things, that's not the church being political. That's the church being the church, being that voice historically that we have seen from the beginning when the apostles who were told not to, not to keep preaching in the name of Jesus said, we must obey God rather than men. So it's, yeah, it's more essential in our time than ever. So great to hear you say that, Father. Um, you know, you also have there as another person receiving an award is Mark Hook. Okay, we all know, we all love Mark Hook. Tell us about Mark, just for those who may not know, understand what this guy has done. He's a legend around a lot of Catholic circles yes. for what he did a couple of years ago. Catholic, a father of a, of a large family, pro-life activist, uh, has been praying out in front of abortion facilities and teaching his children how to do so. And it was in a That's context right. of that where he had one of his sons with him praying in front of one of these death camps, uh, one of the death scorts, as we call them, these folks that literally escort moms and their babies in there for the babies to be, uh, to be, to be dismembered. Um, one of those death scorts was harassing Mark and his son. And there was an altercation between uh, the two of them. And, but the bottom line was then, uh, you know, the local authorities in Philadelphia uh, said, now this is nothing to be uh, prosecuted here. But lo and behold, leave it to the, to the Biden administration. They picked up on the case and brought a federal charge against Mark. You know, what in the world could be the federal charge when local law enforcement said there wasn't anything here to pursue? It was the FACE law, which was signed by Bill Clinton back in 1994, and which makes it a federal crime 
to intimidate somebody going to get, quote, reproductive services, such as abortion, uh, or to physically block. Even if you're completely peaceful, you can't physically block or you can't even intimidate. Now, intimidate, that's, that's subjective. What's going to intimidate one person is not going to intimidate somebody else. So it's 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 uh, it's it's a subjective, and it's questionable in terms of its necessity because local laws already deal with uh, questions of trespass, questions of obstruction of you know public uh, movement of people from one point to another, or certainly of any kind of violence. Uh, and yet, nevertheless, they brought this against him. They actually raided his home. FBI agents with guns drawn in the in the early morning hours confronting him and his uh, family. Uh, he was, praise God, acquitted by uh, uh, by a jury. But uh, for him to have to go through that, uh, it shows the weaponization of government. Number one, Mark is featured in this new film called Police State, and it shows number two the obsession of the Democrats and the Biden administration with abortion, an obsession that they don't seem to be uh, uh, at all interested in hiding. The weaponization of government, which led to Mark Hook's arrest in the, you know, the shakedown on his family house that Saturday morning. We do our own, like, you know, internal polling or just a response we get from people. The number one thing that our Catholic audience gets from emails, texts, all that kind of stuff uh, about issues that they're concerned about, that is it. Weaponization of the government. Yeah. The, the idea that, you know, you know, the FBI targeted uh, Catholic parishes and, you know, it just came out, what, about a month ago that they actually were, you know, going after a Catholic priest uh, and a choir member too. Um, so what do you have to say to that, um, yeah. Frank? And just Well, you know, to, to, to understand weaponization of government, uh, one easy way to describe it is that in the American system of justice, you're supposed to go after a crime in search of a person. So a crime happens, it's identifiable, and then you say, okay, who did it? Let's go find out and give them the necessary punishment. In a weaponized form of of, of government, you go after a person in search of a crime. And this is a Leninist, uh, Marxist kind of way of thinking. Uh, You go out, you say, you know, you look at the person that you don't like and you treat him or her as if they've committed a crime. And then you go and you go to punish them. That's what has happened. Uh, we have uh, at Priest for Life have, have submitted a Freedom of Information Act request for more information about exactly what you just mentioned, this targeting of, of Catholic parishes, people who go to the traditional Latin mass. I mean, this is ridiculous. Uh, and I'm convinced that, you know, the government doesn't care about Catholic theology or liturgy. They just know that Catholics within the circles that are called more conservative or traditional also are more inclined to bring their faith into the public square, into the voting booth, into the halls of Congress, into presidential elections. And I think that is what's got these Democrat uh, weaponized um, uh, government officials uh, concerned. Not, 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 not the niceties of Catholic tradition, but, but, the, but the fact that we're not afraid to uh, challenge public officials. Love that you say that that link. That is that's the truth. You know, a lot of times people who are more uh, into their faith end up being there. It's natural. They take their faith in the public square, so they're going to be targeted. It makes a lot of sense. Um, a question on the abortion issue: We get a lot um, taking advantage to ask the expert. Federal ban or state ban? Does it really just belong in the states? We're all for giving uh, maximum power to the states. You know, we we're um, you know, the United States after all. But isn't the right to life? at the very core of the declaration. So should there not be something at the federal level to protect the rights of the unborn? What do you say to that? You know, the, the, uh, uh, th- this all, of course, has come about because of the reversal of Roe v. Wade, uh, the Dobbs mm-hmm. decision, right, in 2022. And many people mischaracterize it. They, they talk about, well, it moved the issue from the federal to the state level. And it's, no, I've explained to people, it's not that it's a vertical shift. It's a horizontal shift. It's always been on the federal level and it's always been on the state level. States throughout the time of Roe v. Wade, states have passed measures regarding the unborn. Now, maybe it's more regulation of abortion than prohibition. But the point is, even prohibition, like, for example, of partial birth abortion, was upheld both at the state and federal level, even under the Roe v. Wade 
Planned Parenthood versus Casey regime. So it's always been at the federal. It's always been at the state. The shift that has happened has been from the judicial to the legislative. In other words, the court said in 2022 in Dobbs, they said, look, there's no constitutional reason to prevent the people and their elected lawmakers from protecting the unborn. Simple as that. And they said to the people, you want to protect them? You don't have to. But if you want to protect them, go right ahead. Make your case. Persuade your fellow citizens. Persuade your lawmakers and protect them. Uh, so the, the, and, and because they said that, the difference in the states now, but it's also a difference that pertains to the, to the federal Congress, the difference is that when we do pass a law protecting them, that law will not so easily or so automatically get struck down. And we've been seeing, for example, in Indiana, shortly after Dobbs, the people and the lawmakers of Indiana said, we're going to protect these babies right from conception. And the pro-abortion people did what they always do. They challenged it in court. Well, it turns out the Supreme Court of Indiana said, no, no, there's nothing wrong with this law. We're going we're gonna to let it stay. Why should we strike it down? There's no constitutional reason. Roe is no longer controlling. Now it's Dobbs. So that is uh, the new reality that we're dealing with. It really gives us much more new opportunity to put pass protection. Now, pertinent to what you said, it's not only what Dobbs did and didn't say. It's what kind of right we're protecting. What And the example I use is simply this. What sense would it make if the laws in the United States protected your life and mine in Mississippi, but not in New York, in Louisiana, but not in California? That does, we're talking about the most fundamental right that anyone has, upon which all the other rights depend. And we're talking about the fundamental purpose of government, the protection of innocent human life. So because of the fundamental nature of this right, which is asserted in the Declaration of Independence and is asserted in the Constitution under the 14th Amendment, we have to say, of course, it is a federal issue as well. Great answer, uh, Frank. In, um, latest poll numbers out, Trump, 2024. First of the year, he's up, uh, shifting, you know, I'm sure you know this, right? He's beaten Biden, right, in a head-to-head race. All the issues he's winning on practically, except for a couple. One of them is the abortion issue, right? Uh, it's like the, the, the question waging right now in the conservative GOP movement. How do we approach the abortion issue into 2024. Do we back off on it? Do we just go full? Do we just say what it is clearly? I mean, here at Catholic for Catholics, we've had some very, very potent um, Republican strategists reaching out to us and trying to say, tone it down. Just, you know, this is the way you want to go about it. What do you say? Like, what's just, what's a smarter way to do this? Obviously, we believe as Catholics that life begins at conception. How do we approach this issue in, our, in terms of, of garnering the Catholic vote? Right. We have to resist the narrative that abortion is a losing issue because it's not. If you talk about it the right way, President Trump has said as much. You know, he, he has said, look, you know, some of these candidates that have lost on abortion. Did you hear that, everyone? Frank just said it. Abortion is not a losing issue. <laughs> Keep going. Yeah, that's right. And here's, here's the weakness of, of the other side. And here's how we need to challenge them. They want to bring abortion front and center because they think it's an advantage for them. I say to them, we've always wanted abortion to be front and center. Here's the difference between you and us. When we bring abortion forward, we talk about abortion. When you guys bring abortion forward on the Democrat side, you talk about everything but abortion. Abortion is the last thing they want to talk about. Reproductive rights? Listen, I'm in favor of reproductive rights. I don't want to be like China, where the the government is telling the families they have to stop uh, after a certain number of children. No, there is such a thing as a respect for freedom, freedom, choice, uh, reproductive rights, women's health. You want to talk about those things? Then talk about those things. But don't pretend to be talking about abortion. You want to talk about abortion? My challenge to them, and I think every candidate has to challenge his or her opponent with this question. Every legislator in a legislative debate has to challenge the other side with this question. And that is this. Those who are supporting abortion need to be asked, describe what you defend. That's it right there. Because that's something they will never do. And the fact that they will never do that should show everybody who's right and who's wrong on this. 
They will never describe an abortion. Now, we can come forward, we can describe an abortion, and we don't need to use any pro-life sources or any religious sources. We just need to use the medical textbooks on how abortion is done. In those medical textbooks, you find the word dismember. You find the word decapitate. You, it talks about how to tear the baby's body apart while the baby's still alive. It talks about the beating heart. So it's like, are we really going to have a debate on abortion in this country? Or are we just going to pretend to have a debate? I think, John, that as we go into this election, abortion is getting more attention than it usually gets. We need to stand up and say, this abortion debate in America has been a fake debate. And it's going to continue to be a fake debate, and therefore it's not going to get resolved until we start talking about abortion and agree what it is that we're talking about. Define our terms like any rational discussion or debate is supposed to start by. Let's make sure we're talking about the same thing. And then we've got the other side on the run. Uh, so many examples of this that they, they don't want to talk about what an abortion is. You know, when Senator, when Sam Brownback was was governor of of uh, of Kansas. He was senator first, and he became governor of Kansas. He passed the first in the country prohibition of dismemberment abortion. Do you know that when that was debated in the Kansas legislature, the Democrat senators who were arguing against it didn't even say the name of the bill that they were arguing against. They wouldn't even wow. say the name of it. Why? Because the name of it had the word dismemberment in it. And they know that as soon as you talk about dismemberment, who's going to support that? And, and, and it's the same thing with like the heartbeat. When I'm talking about all these heartbeat laws, you saw, as we all saw, uh, the, how the other side, the pro-abortion strategists and advocates, they start, they try to sanitize the language. And they say, oh, well, it's not a heartbeat. It's, it's cardiac activity. And they threw in a few other fancy words with it. It's like, what, what, what's the matter with these people? What's the matter is they're defending something that's indefensible and they don't want to use the language that more accurately describes it because when you accurately describe it, it is self-evident that it's indefensible. It's so reassuring to hear that because that that's obviously hotly debated among a lot of circles about how to approach this issue. And, you, and, you know, we stand exactly what you just said. We have to face it. You know, abortion is you got to bring it front and center. Just talk about it. Talk about what, what it is, especially chemical abortions. I just saw an article. Uh, thanks. You know, Fox actually covered it. Just, just a, a pure testimony of a woman who went through a chemical abortion, which is obviously like the number one method that they use now is chemical abortions, right? And how tragic and how painful that is. So we will be doing that from this end. Cath for Cath is just hitting it straight on and, and, and holding that as a key issue. The unifying power of the pro-life movement. That, that occurred to me too. As you're organizing this event, National Prayer um, Service, right before the march, what you're doing just from an objective thing, this pro-life uh, cause has brought people together for the conservative movement in general. So to de-emphasize this movement is also to de-emphasize the unity of the conservative movement. Would you agree with that? It's really been a unifying thing. It's kind of like sports, but it's like it's brought us together. And, and DC's like the March for Life is like a family reunion of sorts. Oh, Would yes. you agree? It has brought together people from across uh, denominational lines. Uh, that's why our service is interdenominational. We celebrate the unity. It brings people in together uh, across age differences, ethnicities. It, it's, it's marvelous. In fact, that was one of the things that most impressed me when I first went to my, my first March for Life was the third one, then 1976. And that's when I was a teenager. Were you I a was, seminarian? I'm sorry? Were you a seminarian not or yet. a priest still? No, not yet. I was still, I was a senior in high school. I was, I would have, I went into the seminary the following year, but, uh, but I was so impressed at the march by this diversity of the crowd and yet the palpable unity calling for the protection of the most defenseless. We're uh, reaching the end of the of your time. We're respectful of that, uh, Frank. Uh, what else do you have just to, to to let people know, be aware of? Because obviously, not everyone who's going to watch this can attend. But the importance, probably, just of being in unison with prayer. Right, the nation that prays together stays together. Uh, what what do you want to tell people who can't be there and just uh, for any other uh, details about the day itself? Well, this is a time for all of us to to increase the attention that we give to the issue. And, and the fact that this is happening in an election year, uh, I, 
would call them to pray in union with the people who are going to be in, not only in D.C., but also at the Walk for Life in, in San Francisco and at various state marches throughout the year, pray. We have a special prayer website called Pro Life Prayers. Dot com. And secondly, we are doing these events in January at the beginning of a key election year. We've talked a little bit about the politics. Uh, ProLifeVote.com. We have ongoing training and encouragement for people to make the most of this election year right in their own community. So uh, they don't even need to... Um, uh, travel or, or, or undergo any great inconvenience. We want to bring the issue right to them at home. We want to bring the tools right there at home. And uh, we encourage people to be in touch with us, with you, with the many other groups that are doing something. But get involved in one way or another. We need every last person at this point in time. And people, do your part. Obviously, you got to pray. But if you can't be there or if, or if you are going to be there, do your part by beating big tech, big media. We know it's not going to get the coverage that it deserves. It never does. It's the biggest event in D.C. every year. It barely gets anything. So what are you going to do? you got to share it on social media. you got to text it. you got to show up, uh, pictures. Spread the news. We can do this. We can beat big tech, okay? That's why it's important to sign up for updates, either from Priests for Life or Catholics for Catholics, uh, so you can get direct email and direct uh, or text messages on news and, and events. So as we conclude, um, Frank, I just wanted to personally thank you also. You know, it's you've seen how I've stumbled at times calling you father. You know, it's always going to be difficult. It I respect so much that you have tried to obey uh, where obedience is due. Yeah, balancing that obedience to God and man. It's it's not a, not an easy thing to do with the, with the number of, canceled priests and canceled bishops who are on the, you know, in the cultural fight today. And really want to thank you for that testimony that says a lot. Uh, could you end us with a prayer? Absolutely. Absolutely. And thank you for saying that too. You know, I, I consider my case, my situation to be the, the easiest one of all, because all I do is stand up and say, you know what, we're just trying to stop babies from being killed. Uh, we're just trying to heal and save those that have been harmed by abortion. So let's pray exactly for that. Uh, Father, we come before you with uh, praise and thanksgiving. You are the God of life. Thank you for our lives. Thank you for the privilege of defending life. Uh, Lord, enable our words and our witness to, to convince our fellow citizens, our fellow voters, our elected representatives, our church leaders, to convince everyone, Lord, that abortion must be absolutely abolished, that these children must be protected, uh, and that, that wounded hearts and souls must be healed. Make us vessels of your healing, of your peace, and of your life. We ask all this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Mary, Mother of Life, pray for us in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The best part about this all is to us sacerdos in eternum. No one can touch that ever, and that's the most amazing thing. And same goes with Strickland, 2S Bishop in Eternum. Yes. You know, so um, this is what we do. Catholics for Catholics. We're a new group on the market, and we just, we like our name says, we get behind Catholics who are really Catholics in the public square. Frank is one of them. Support him. Support the cause. See everyone next week, uh, either there in person or in the spirit of prayer of Christian unity, which we do so well as a country. God bless you all, and we'll see you there.